As we've already discussed, privacy is a slippery concept. It's hard to pin down and provide any exact definition for it that doesn't immediately suffer from numerous counterexamples or logical inconsistencies or similar. But we're not giving up so easily. Just because a concept of privacy can't be defined in some simple and straightforward way doesn't mean that we can't learn an awful lot about it by looking at how it's been approached and discussed in different times and places. After all, every legal system in the world protects at least some aspects of privacy. And yes, the law might never be entirely satisfactory in terms of staying relevant and up to date with all the latest technological developments, but an overview of the way legal privacy protections have grown and expanded over time, and the resulting ripples this has caused in related legal and conceptual research, might allow us to better appreciate which way privacy is currently headed, its general thrust and direction right here and right now. So let's do that. However, before that, a few small things we need to get out of the way, just to make sure we're all starting from the same place. The first is to say a few words about how and why the law grows and develops and changes over time. Well, the simple answer is that the law develops to deal with those things that people in society are concerned about. Not just anything, of course, but the sorts of things that enough people are concerned enough about and that doesn't come into obvious conflict with already existing law. So, for instance, it used to be that not enough people were concerned enough for there to be laws safeguarding the well-being of children. And so children tended to be abused and exploited and put to work in dangerous factories and so on. As time went on, however, enough people became concerned enough with the well-being of children that many countries began implementing laws forbidding child abuse, child exploitation, child labor, and so on. And it's not just in the past. We're currently living through these sorts of developments right now, too. For instance, an increasing number of people are becoming increasingly concerned about the climate, and so there is a push for this to be reflected in the law. However, doing so often clashes with existing laws, such as laws on the legal rights and responsibilities of corporations and such. Where will this all end? Who knows? But like in the case of child labor, there's a good chance our children or grandchildren will look back on the current developments underway as long overdue and morally necessary, whatever they ultimately wind up being. Now, so far, this should all be pretty obvious to everybody. The law changes in ways that reflect the society's concerns. Slowly and reactively, sure, and sometimes also insufficiently, but it still tracks, in some sense, the sorts of things that people in a society tend to be most concerned about. So that's the why. But what about the how? How does the law develop over time? Well, very basically, we could say that the two major forces at play are legislation and precedent. So let's talk a little about each. Legislation is what happens when lawmakers, such as elected politicians, develop new laws for their country. This happens in most legal systems in the world, but is the fundamental and primary source of all law in so-called civil law or Roman law systems, which is what we find in most of the non-English speaking and non-Islamic world. In these civil law systems, lawmakers first develop legislation and then the courts hear cases relevant to that legislation and try to decide the cases in accordance with it. They have quite a lot of freedom to interpret how the legislation applies to any individual case, but for the very same reason, the final court decisions don't usually hold that much weight for other related cases in the future. Precedent, on the other hand, is when courts are required to take prior court decisions into account, especially those decisions that were made in the higher courts of a country. And although civil law systems will also sometimes put a little weight on how prior cases have been decided, it's an absolutely fundamental and primary source of the law in so-called common law systems, which is what we find in most of the English-speaking world. In these common law systems, courts not only interpret existing legislation in a way that is strongly binding, or at least highly persuasive, on future cases, but they also have the ability to develop entire areas of law where there's no legislation of any kind merely by looking at the precedent set by relevant previous court cases. On the one hand, this makes the courts in common law systems far more powerful players in actually developing the law compared to the courts in civil law systems, where they only apply it. 
On the other hand, it can also sometimes leave common law court decisions a little more uncertain and open to interpretation than in civil law systems. In fact, when reading common law case reports, you can often vaguely hint the outline of some sort of general legal principle which arises out of all the cited cases collectively, rather than from any single case, but only really exists in the minds of the judges and legal scholars and others working on interpreting the meanings of the precedents in this way. It can sometimes be almost like poetry. You only really intuit glimpses of the real meaning somewhere behind the words of the case reports you're reading. Okay, so legislation and precedent. Civil law systems emphasize legislation, while common law systems emphasize both legislation and precedent. Now, in both cases, the law still needs to develop in accordance with the major concerns in society. But the way those concerns feed into the law differs for each source of the law in a rather interesting way. When it comes to legislation, in both civil and common law systems, the question is how lawmakers keep track of what people in a society are concerned enough about so that they know what sorts of things to develop legislation for. Well, sometimes, of course, they're elected on a specifically profiled political platform. So you can expect that if they gain enough political power, then they'll start developing legislation on their specific profile issues. Other times, societal concerns come up organically, in a way that no one party or politician is profiled for or against, but which still needs to be dealt with, like the development of a new and potentially quite harmful technology or similar. So, for instance, think social media and all the current concerns lawmakers around the world have about it, despite it not really being any sort of concern for anybody around 20 years ago. But either way, whether they're profiled toward some specific piece of legislation or not, lawmakers will spend a lot of time looking at legal scholarly work, so research done by legal researchers. This could be, for instance, academic articles, where legal scholars argue for one point or another like that two existing pieces of legislation are in conflict and so need to be revised, or that some specific court case proves that there is some missing legislation that needs to be developed or similar. The politicians probably don't read these articles themselves. After all, they were elected to lead, not to read. But they will typically have various advisory committees and specialist hearings and so on, so their legal advisor nerds can bring them up to speed. Now, when it comes to precedent, the tracking of societal concerns is a little different. Because precedent is binding, or at least persuasive, in common law systems, there's a crucial need to publish reports of all cases that provide some sort of precedent for future cases to rely on. These will generally include lengthy reasoning by the court about why it has reached a specific decision and on the basis of what prior precedents. These case reports are then poured over and picked apart by legal scholars as they look to, for example, develop a view of the hidden underlying general legal principles that arise from a collection of precedents, or maybe point out how some specific court's decision is actually in conflict with other precedents that the case may not have considered, or similar. And this has a substantial corrective impact on the work of the courts. In their decisions, Common law courts will often cite legal research when deciding cases, as a way of backing up their reasoning. In common law systems, there is, in other words, a sort of symbiotic back and forth between court decisions and legal research. The court decisions form the basis for what the research focuses on, while the research can then often become the basis for subsequent court decisions, and on and on it goes. So, as I hope you can see, in both cases, in both legislation and precedent, legal research has a large impact on the way the law develops. And the legal scholars themselves? Well, here comes a crucial point. When legal scholars are doing basic work on a wide-ranging and contentious topic like privacy, well, then they tend to be quite concerned with what the concept of privacy really means. And for this, more often than not, they will turn to philosophers and their research. Now, philosophers typically work on developing strong, robust concepts, but don't usually care all that much about their application in practice. Instead, it's normally the legal scholars who take the philosophical definitions and work with them to try to kind of translate them into possible real legal applications, whether in the form of explicit legislation or implicit precedent principles.
And personally, as a philosopher by background, I have to say, this is kind of neat. After all, who would have thought that abstract and complex philosophy might actually be so practically relevant to, well, all of us? Not only that, but this is also where it starts to get really interesting. You see, once the law develops, a sort of feedback effect can happen here. Because the law is a sort of baseline for everybody in a society, this means that legal scholars, and yes, even philosophers, will often have stuff to say about new legal developments, whether we're talking about legislation or precedent. So not only does philosophical research on some concept occasionally dictate the form of some real-world legal development, but the legal development will then itself become the focus of new philosophical and legal research on the same concept. So perhaps I define privacy some way, publish my definition in legalish philosophy journals, influence a bunch of legal scholars who then use my definition of privacy to suggest new legislation or some new interpretation of precedent, which then kind of trickles up to lawmakers or courts who apply it in practice, which then gives me more real-world cases to reflect on in my conceptual work. It's sort of like if you tell your friend that you have this great idea for a finished tango cover band, and then she takes your idea and runs with it and creates her own hugely successful finished tango cover band, playing all the most famous songs like Satuma or Suosana Vine, but in a slightly new and different way. And you then use her band's success to revise and refine your understanding of what finished tango is really all about, and come with a new and improved idea for an even better finished tango cover band. Really, the virtuous circle possibilities are almost endless. Okay, so the law develops in a way that mirrors major concerns in society, and philosophers and legal scholars play a big role in how the law, whether in legislation or in precedent, develops its concepts, which directly determines what specific sorts of cases the resulting legal development will actually apply to. And then that very same legal development forms a new baseline for further conceptual and legal research on the topic, which again feeds into legal developments and so on. Noise. So with that out of the way, let's now talk about legal privacy protections throughout history. And I'm going to start with English common law. Why England? Well, first, because it's one of the world's longest standing continuous legal systems, and therefore gives us a broader historical scope than almost any other country from which to investigate the development of legal privacy protections over time. But also because it forms a historical basis for United States common law. And why is US law so important? Again, two reasons. First, because specific legal developments in the US during the 20th century led to by far the most extensive privacy research by both legal scholars and philosophers that the world has so far seen. And second, because no matter where in the world you live today, US privacy law still impacts you in the way that it, for instance, regulates the behavior of multinational tech conglomerates. Like when Facebook stores and processes data from your account in giant server farms on American soil, regardless where in the world you happen to be located. All right, let's get started. Now, if we begin with English law, we can see early development of legal protections of personal physical space and goods in relation to law on trespass, nuisance, and harassment. Further down the line, English law developed protections against revealing some sorts of information about others. If the information was false, it would be covered by defamation law, while if it was true, it might be covered by blackmail law or perhaps confidentiality law. I'm going to dwell on this last one a little because it provides a great example of how English legal privacy protections have developed over time. To start with, in 1576, English courts recognized the need to protect all communication between a lawyer and their client so that your lawyer couldn't be forced to testify against you in court. Similar protections were established three years later between spouses. Quite a bit later, in 1741, a case involving Jonathan Swift of Gulliver's Travels found that even if you sent a letter to somebody else, and it was, so to say, their physical property, they still couldn't publish the contents of that letter as it remained your property. Basically, it was still your ideas and words, so others couldn't just use those however they saw fit. In 
More importantly, the 18th century also saw the development of various so-called duties of non-disclosure. This area of the law started small, but eventually grew over the centuries to a prohibition on any of a number of different recognized confidential relationships. So this would be things like that business partners couldn't steal ideas from each other and present as their own, or that academic journals couldn't publish lectures submitted by a diligent student taking notes without the lecturer's express consent to publish, or that a photographer couldn't use the negatives from a private photo shoot with a paying client for the sake of making and selling Christmas cards in his shop. But the really big case, the arguably most important privacy case in world history, was Prince Albert v. Strange from 1849. So here's how the case went. Prince Albert and his family, including his wife, Queen Victoria, had made a number of drawings and etchings for their own personal use and amusement. They commissioned a royal printer to make copies of these, and without the printer's knowledge, one of his employees took some of the copies for himself. He sold them, and they eventually made their way into the hands of the defendant, Mr. Strange, who wanted to not only exhibit them, but had also printed a catalog describing them to potential buyers. The Queen and her husband sued for the prevention of the exhibition and the publication of the catalog. Since the case wasn't very obviously covered by previous precedent, but kind of fit in under a general principle expansion of various previous cases, the court claimed an original and independent jurisdiction and found in the royal family's favor, arguing that privacy is the right invaded. Now, this is worth pausing for a moment to reflect on. I didn't mention it yet, but there is not, nor has there ever been, any general right to privacy in English law. There have been numerous attempts to legislate one in Parliament over the years, but it's never come to be. So for the court in Prince Albert to argue that privacy is the right invaded was really quite a surprising statement, and one that would later come to have a pivotal impact on U.S. privacy law, a fact I'll return to in a moment. Staying in England for now, various legal developments in the 20th century helped to illustrate some really very central features of legal protections of privacy. One important case was that of K.V. Robertson from 1991. In this case, the well-known actor, Gordon Kay, was recovering in hospital after a serious traffic accident. After several days on life support, followed by a period in intensive care, he was moved to a private room. A journalist from the tabloid newspaper Sunday Sport then surreptitiously gained access to Kay's room and interviewed and took photos of him before being removed by hospital security. Kay couldn't remember the whole thing just 15 minutes later. Through friends, he tried to stop the tabloid from publishing the interview by suing them on the basis of malicious falsehood, libel, passing off, and trespass to the person. The court, however, disagreed with all the claims except malicious falsehood, which meant that the tabloid was only prohibited from making any statement that Kay had consented to the interviewer photos, but no prohibition otherwise on their publication. The judges did argue that the case clearly showed there was a need to legislate privacy protections in the UK, but that their hands were tied. Now, what this case really shows is that legal privacy protections often tend to clash with legal protections of other societal values, such as freedom of speech and freedom of the press. In fact, this is a recurring feature of privacy, and one we can see popping up again and again in the UK legal context whether it's about the now-defunct Murdoch-owned tabloid News of the World, hacking into teenage murder victim Millie Dowler's phone voicemail after she was reported missing, or various Premier League footballers using the English court system to stop tabloids from publishing details about their intimate and illicit affairs. In all these cases, the question typically boils down to how much is protecting privacy worth how much is public interest in the details of the situation worth, and which one should win out in this particular case. Now, if we zoom out from England for a moment and look at Europe, there are two primary sources of legal privacy protections. One is the European Convention on Human Rights, and it's Article 8, which provides another nice illustration of the balancing act that legal privacy protections must play. 
Article 8 states that every person has a right to respect for her private and family life, her home, and her correspondence, and that no authority can interfere with this right except as is in accordance with the law and as necessary in a democratic society in the interest of national security, public safety, or the economic well-being of the country, for the prevention of disorder or crime, for the protection of health or morals, or for the protection of the rights and freedoms of others. In other words, just like in the English tabloid cases, at the level of the Council of Europe, which includes far more countries than just the European Union, the fundamental right to privacy is explicitly balanced against various other values and interests in society. And if we zoom back in a little, this time to the European Union, then we get the General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR, from 2018. I take it most of you are familiar with this, and I'll have a lot more to say about it in the next video, when we discuss privacy and data security. But at this stage, it's worth noting just two things. First, that the GDPR as a legal EU instrument must be implemented in full in all EU member states. So it has real force of law, in other words. And second, the GDPR has already had a large-scale impact on the way that many of the multinational tech conglomerates work, given that it regulates, among many other things, the transfer of any personal data about EU citizens and denizens to anywhere else outside the EU, including the US. So yeah, there's a whole patchwork of legal privacy protections in England, and they've developed and multiplied over time, but there's no general right to privacy in the country. Well, there is a general right to privacy according to the European Convention on Human Rights, of which the UK is, even after Brexit, still a signatory. But how this right is interpreted varies somewhat between countries and is stymied by the fact that the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg has an insane backlog of cases, on the latest count upward of some 60,000 or so still waiting to be heard. And then, in the European Union, the GDPR has been a monumental development in legal privacy protections these past few years. But, as I already said before, that's something I'll talk more about in the next video. Okay, that's England and Europe out of the way. Now, let's rewind all the way back to 1849 and Prince Albert v. Strange. First and foremost, and as I already mentioned, US common law was, at the time, still citing English court cases as precedent. And as regards Prince Albert, the result of the case was that two young legal scholars wrote an article in 1890 called The Right to Privacy, which would change US privacy law forever. The authors, Samuel Warren and Louis Brandeis, were what we today might call, well, a tad hysterical about technological developments. Basically, they worried about two things. First, they worried about the flourishing of so-called yellow papers, basically the tabloids of the late 19th century, and the way that these papers printed gossip and rumors with abandon. Second, they worried about the recent development in 1888 of Eastman Dry Plate Company's so-called Kodak camera, a new technology that allowed point-and-shoot photography at an affordable price and which completely revolutionized media access to photography. And, more importantly, which all of a sudden made covert photography possible in a way it had never been before. Therefore, in the view of Warren and Brandeis, these two factors, taken together, had jointly invaded the sacred precincts of private and domestic life and threatened to make good the prediction that what is whispered in the closet shall be proclaimed from the housetops. More interesting for us here, however, was that they reached a conclusion not that we needed to legislate some sort of new right to privacy, but rather that its existence was already implied by existing precedent, in particular Prince Albert v. Strange. In their view, what had originally served as a primitive notion of a right to life had, over time, expanded to include various rights about more than just the physical being of a person. These included protections from assault, as opposed to just from battery, from nuisance, and from slander and libel, as well as protections of both tangible and intangible property, such as trademarks and literary and artistic works. A legal right to privacy was then, they argued, only the next stage of this natural expansion of the common law. All the courts needed to do was to recognize this, and voila, a legal general right to privacy would be established in the US.
They then went on to analyze what this sort of right to privacy would look like in some detail and thereby wrote the first real philosophical article on the concept of privacy, what it was, why it was valuable, how to protect it within the legal system of the time, and so on. Now, the U.S. courts were initially somewhat slow to adopt Warren and Brandeis's recommendations, but they started doing so increasingly over time. By the mid-20th century, there were already hundreds of cases, either directly or indirectly, inspired by Warren and Brandeis. In 1960, legal scholar William Prosser took the many cases and grouped them all into four basic categories. One, intrusion into a person's seclusion or solitude, so basically bothering others in their private space. Two, public disclosure of embarrassing private facts, at least when not coupled with a threat, since then it would become about blackmail rather than just privacy. Three, publicity which places a person in a false light, that is, which gives an incorrect and probably harmful impression of somebody, like by quoting them selectively and out of context. And four, appropriation of a person's likeness, so, for instance, using someone's photo without their consent for some stupid ad campaign or similar. Interestingly, in publishing this taxonomy of privacy cases, Prosser was trying to describe in a systematic way how privacy case law had developed up to that point. But the effect of his publication was a different one. It basically set in stone the way in which all privacy cases were considered from then on. In other words, after Prosser, the courts all referred back to his four-part taxonomy when considering any relevant privacy case. Now, once again, this is where it starts getting really interesting. Both Warren and Brandeis and Prosser show how conceptual research can impact legal practice in quite significant ways. But the truly bizarre twist in this entire story belongs to the U.S. Supreme Court. Okay, so for those of you who don't know, the Supreme Court in the United States has one main focus, to protect and apply the U.S. Constitution to the various cases it hears. And it has enormous power in doing so. For instance, not only do all its cases constitute binding precedent in U.S. common law, it also has the ability to, for instance, nullify existing legislation if it finds that the legislation is in conflict with the U.S. Constitution. The court consists of nine justices who decide cases by simple majority, for or against. As I'm sure you can appreciate, given its immense power, there's a reason why both Democrats and Republicans are so obsessed with strategizing about how to get their own progressive or conservative nominations onto the court. But back to privacy. This is where it starts getting weird. You see, in 1965, the Supreme Court heard a very important case, Griswold v. Connecticut. The case concerned a state law in Connecticut making it illegal to provide contraceptives to married couples. The court found that the state law was in conflict with the U.S. Constitution and its amendments, but in doing so, the different justices based their reasoning on completely different chains of logic. So Justice Douglas, writing for the court, argued that this sort of right to a zone of privacy emanated from several constitutional amendments. The first, concerning freedom of speech. The third, concerning the protection of an individual's home. The fourth, concerning protection against unreasonable searches and seizures. And the fifth, concerning protection against abuse of government, authority, and legal procedures. All right, already here it's a bit conceptually unclear, but fair enough. But then, in concurring opinions, Justice Goldberg argued instead that privacy emanated from the Ninth Amendment, which states that the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. And Justices Harlan and White, also concurring, argued that it was based on the Fourteenth Amendment about due process. So, conceptually, this was a complete mess None of the justices seemed to be able to agree on what a constitutional right to privacy came from, even if they agreed it existed. And as if this wasn't problematic enough, the Supreme Court then went on to expand its conception of privacy numerous times, like in Eisenstadt v. Baird in 1972, arguing that this right to privacy protected the contraceptive and sexual choices of all individuals, regardless of their marital status. Or in the landmark 1973 case Roe v. Wade, which found that the same sort of principle applied to the choice of having an abortion. 
Although, obviously, we need to note that in 2022, the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade as precedent, so it no longer applies. Or, more important for present purposes, the 1977 case of Whalen v. Roe, no relation to the Roe and Roe v. Wade. The case concerned New York state laws that required the collection and storage of information about certain sorts of drug prescriptions, including the name of the prescribing doctor, the pharmacy dispensing the drug, the name and dosage of the drug, and the name, address, and age of the patient receiving it. In its ruling in the case, the Supreme Court recognized a dual nature of its conception of privacy arguing that one aspect of it concerned the individual interest in avoiding disclosure of personal matters, while the other concerned the interest in independence in making certain kinds of important decisions. And there you have it. Privacy, starting from something like an extremely limited English legal protection prohibiting lawyers from being forced to testify against their own clients in court, had through Warren and Brandeis, Prosser, and Supreme Court case law, come to mean both a protection against having certain forms of personal information divulged to others, as well as a protection from interference with making certain kinds of important life decisions. Now, this is where we leave the law and move to philosophy. Because after this, the privacy philosophers went a little crazy, as did several legal scholars. Essentially, you could say they all broke into two general camps. One camp thought that the latter important life decisions type of privacy was warranted and conceptually appropriate, and another camp whose members argued that it was fundamentally mistaken and proof only of the Supreme Court's conceptual confusion. In their view, these sorts of decisions were perhaps about autonomy or liberty or something similar, but definitely not privacy. And so the debates between the two camps rocked back and forth for years, with numerous philosophers adding their own suggested definitions of privacy to the discussion. Now, I won't bore you with all the details about this, but suffice it to say that the Supreme Court view of privacy, with its shaky conceptual foundations and slowly expanding definition, manages to nicely illustrate one very central and crucial question regarding the concept of privacy. And that is just this. When we define an emotionally loaded and important concept, such as privacy, who decides what the definition should and should not cover? For most philosophers of privacy, the answer is probably, well, just use my definition. But let's see if we can't do better than that. All right, first and foremost, let's talk about how we define concepts. Let's say I define the concept chair as four-legged wooden seating furniture for one person. All right. Now, how about this? It looks like a chair, but it's not wooden, it's metal. Now, what is the appropriate response to this? Actually, it turns out there are two equally valid responses. The first possibility is to say, oh, right, I guess I need to go and change my definition into something else, like four-legged seating furniture for one person. Then it covers both wood and metal and plastic and any other possible materials. But perhaps then we run into other issues which require further revisions of our definition, like a three-legged chair or a throne. Is it really a chair or similar? All right, so that's one way of responding to our definition running into a perceived counterexample. But the other way we could respond would be, as philosophers tend to call it, to bite the bullet and respond with a simple, sorry, that's not a chair because it's not wooden. If somebody were to question this conclusion, we could simply respond by saying something like that. Most people use most of their concepts in very sloppy and irresponsible ways, and so the fact that our definition isn't to everybody's taste makes little or no difference. It might still be a stronger and more coherent definition than the common one. So basically everyone who disagrees with the definition can get lost. And this, in a nutshell, summarizes what's going on between the two privacy camps. On the one hand, there are philosophers and legal scholars who argue that the Supreme Court expansion of privacy is correct, and that privacy is basically whatever people think it is. Do people have incoherent views about it? No problem. We can just throw different incompatible definitions together, neatly separated by an or. So then privacy might be defined as being all about personal information, or all about important life decisions, or both. Let's call this a wide definition of privacy. 
The most extreme example of this is probably legal scholar Daniel Solove's lucid 2006 article, A Taxonomy of Privacy, where he lists not two, but 16 separate ways in which privacy can be harmed. What is privacy in Solove's view? As his article has it, any or all of the 16 options he presents. On the other hand, those who argue that the Supreme Court expansion of privacy is wrong, and that privacy is really only about personal information and nothing else, will typically defend their definitions with a sort of dismissive shrug. You don't like my definition? Well, sucks to be you, get over it. Especially if they have good solid arguments to support that their definition really does solve some other problems or provide a better way of approaching specific issues. Let's call this a narrow definition of privacy. Now, I hope you all understand that I'm oversimplifying what is in reality a rather nuanced and complex debate. But I think that even if I'm oversimplifying, I'm still highlighting an important fundamental difference in how different philosophers and legal scholars think about concepts and their definitions. Either they are far more flexible and permissive, with an attendant risk of developing a clumsy and possibly somewhat incoherent but very wide definition of privacy, or they are far more strict and limited, with an attendant risk of developing a precise and coherent narrow definition of privacy, but one that is too far removed from the way the term is actually used in society, so as to render it largely irrelevant. And what's better? Honestly, who knows? A concept that balloons and expands too much can become too all-encompassing, thereby dissolving into some sort of vague meaninglessness. But a concept that is kept restricted in the face of other people's conflicting views risks becoming completely irrelevant. How do we solve this? Well, I wish I knew. Fortunately, though, I don't think we need to. I mean, we might be drawn more to wide or to narrow approaches, but I don't think we will ever establish which one is ultimately better or more true, because we don't know how we would ever properly assess something like that. On the other hand, this probably doesn't matter so much because we've already made significant progress on a number of other fronts, which are worth summarizing. First of all, the concept of privacy is hotly contested by many people, and this has real-life implications, for instance, in legal cases that may find that privacy, on some specific legal definition, has not been threatened or harmed, even if you might very much feel that it has. Like K.V. Robertson. Understanding this, we can appreciate that influencing how definitions of privacy are developed in philosophical and legal research can have very big real-life implications, and so are worth taking seriously. Second, we can also appreciate that no matter which definition of privacy we're presented with, the historical thrust of the concept so far indicates that it will continue to change and develop over time, not least as new technologies are developed and launched into the world. In other words, the concept of privacy is always in some state of flux, and we probably won't ever be able to pin it down completely. Third, we know that whatever your definition of privacy might be, it will typically always need to be balanced against other societal values and interests, like freedom of the press or the ability of a government to undertake reasonable criminal investigations. How far these various values and interests trump the others obviously remains an open question, and may well vary a lot from one individual case to another. But that any proposed protection of privacy will typically need to be balanced against something else, that holds true regardless. Finally, although this sort of lack of any clear and determinate definition of privacy might be seen as deeply dissatisfying, I don't actually think having a clear and universally agreed definition is at all necessary to make progress on various privacy issues in our own societies today. I could say a lot more about this, but I will leave it for the two following videos in this series. In the first of these, we'll discuss in far more practical detail than what I've done here how privacy and data security intersect with each other and what the implications of this are. Then, after that, we will talk about the relationships between the two general components of the Supreme Court's definition, privacy and autonomy. And as we will see there, I don't think we need precise definitions of either term in either case to make substantial progress on these issues. I look forward to continuing our conversation.